Hello all, I'm Kel Kidman, welcome to Breaking on the Daily, and today we have how Biden can be both far left and the most far left president in history, and also be uh, extremely disappointing to leftists. Also, Dominion, a report on Dominion Software finds that a, uh, that the CIS software was designed to rig elections, and h how people are are just getting tired of COVID lockdowns and the evidence of such. All that and more today on Breaking on the Daily. And we begin with a second PA educator is now filing a suit over losing job over conservative memes. Now, for those who don't know, this is an update to an older story, one that I didn't cover a, because I think it happened before this show even began. But to continue uh, to give you the rundown about how this story began, this educator, uh, Ashley Bennett, was a special education education supervisor with 27 years of service, who resigned in July after put on after being put on leave in June because of uh, certain posts on her Facebook page. And these were posts having to do with Black Lives Matter and all of the riots that were going on and her talking about how, uh, and also with COVID lockdowns and talking about how there was a hypocrisy there, which evidently there was. And she was put on leave because of this. And, you know, one of the most worrying things about all of the, uh, all of the sort of uh, social trends that you've seen as of recent is what I would call the coward's use of force. And uh, it, to put it, it, that's just a fancy way of saying essentially ostracism, ostracism and ostracizing people. It has become very, very common in current culture to simply ostracize people and then claim the moral high ground because you have not used force against them. But to be honest, ostracization is simply a coward's use of force. Force, And to explain why I believe that, uh, ostracization is used as a way to illegitimize what people are doing and prevent them from doing things. But it isn't the same as force because, well, it's not using physical force, but it is using a certain level of social, social pressure, which while not uh, material in, in any physical sense, it is material in the sense of people are very easily affected by social pressure. And the left has been using uh, this sort of social pressure and uh, coward's use of force all over the place over the past few years uh, with their tactics of social ostracization, which has been termed as cancel culture. And this is just another example of such. And it's a... Uh, it is worrying, however, I do suspect that this will end in large backlash over the next few years. You've already seen p lots of people flee from the platforms which regularly uh, support this sort of social ostracization nonsense. Places like Twitter, be uh, people fleeing to places like Parler and such like that. Which, by the way, if you haven't already, I would suggest you do par follow me on Parler. It is the place where I actually you know, uh, do things <laughs> rather than just mostly post video links and troll, but or argue with people, uh, it, it, which is what I use Twitter for essentially. But it's quite interesting. This, this lawsuit, this lawsuit essentially, <laughs> she's targeting the, uh, school district saying that the response from the district caused her to become a pariah. I think it's, it, it, it's, She's accusing them of essentially like, torturous interference in contract or something like that. Not exactly sure. It, but really the more important thing, rather than the specific case, is the overall trend. It, we need to, of course, be paying attention to both as the individual cases, uh, equally as important as the large-scale societal problem, of course. Uh, any individual win will, of course, uh, contribute to the uh, to a changing of the tide which is necessary considering where the where our culture has gone in recent years but it, i will be keeping you updated on this case and i do hope that she wins this lawsuit because frankly i, I am sick and tired of the coward's use of force uh, of cancel culture and all that sort of thing i really am sick of it but anyway, on to our next big headline story, and this is more of an op-ed for me, because it isn't a particular headline I'm talking about. Rather, I'm talking about two stories from the Washington Examiner. Now, the first story is about how Biden's cha transition is teeming with big tech insiders. It talks a lot about how it's teeming with people from Google and a lot of corporations and all that sort of stuff. The sort of thing you'd expect from a corporate Democrat, a uh, far, uh, not far left, a, a, a 
corporatist Democrat, you know, the type of people that the far left of the Democratic Party <laughs> supposedly hates, you know, the sorts of communists and all those sorts of people who they, who they hate. But then you have in this next article from, once again, the Washington Examiner, a, a cacophony of identity politics compli uh, complicates Biden cabinet choices. Now, these are two almost contradictory stories within this same newspaper. Uh, one is a, is a story of corporate in influence in a Democrat party, in a Democrat party administration, one that you would expect to see when you're covering a sort of corporate Democrat, uh, a, a corporate Democrat administration, which in, all, in a lot of respects, Biden is. He is very much the sort of establishment hack man who uh, flays in, uh, flails in the wind and doesn't really have any positions of his own and just uh, falls to his DNC and corporate uh, suitors, you know, uh, the sort of people who are uh, really in control of the administration. But of course you have the other a story of him being inundated with identity politics, which you'd expect from the far left progressive wing of the party. And so this leads to, uh, this sort of dissonance has been a huge, not problem I'd say, but rather a huge dissonance within the Biden uh, campaign and, and now transition team and all that sort of stuff and potential future administration, asterisk administration. But what it, it, what it has led to is people on the right and particularly conservatives and that sort of thing, uh, you know, partisan sort of Republicans, and it, it leads to them saying multiple things at once, <laughs> and it seems to be coming out of both sides of their mouth, uh, they seem to be speaking out of both sides of their mouth, at once saying that Biden will be the most far-left president of all time, and will have all of these progressive policies, and will be a, a, a uh, essentially a cat's paw for the far left, and at the same time saying, you look, far left, Antifa types, you're going to be disappointed by Biden because he isn't going to be far left enough. Now, the uh, those statements at first seem, and, and positions, at first seem almost contradictory. However, they aren't. And here's what I'm going to explain to you. Because you have to understand that in both of those statements, you're dealing with a fundamentally different, uh, a different perception of the political spectrum. Because one perspective of the political spectrum is coming from the right's perspective of the political spectrum. Uh, people like how I, uh, how I would perceive of the political spectrum. And based on how I perceive of the political spectrum, Biden is extremely far left. He, he looks very, very far away from me based on his policies in terms of supporting the Great Reset with things like Build Back Better, uh, the same group of people that says you will own nothing in 2030, uh, you know, and all of these far left policies, Medicare for all, all of these sorts of things, he is very far left on, uh, you know, far left on borders and all these sorts of policies, he is very far left on. But then you have this other perception of the political spectrum, and that being the perception of the political spectrum as viewed from the communist perspective. Because from the communist perspective, Biden might as well be uh, <laughs> freaking Hitler. He might as well be... Uh, a freaking Genghis Khan. He might as well be, uh, you know, all of these far-right specters that they say. Because when you're looking at it from the communist perspective, well, it, quite literally, despite the fact that this is a meme, everyone to the right of Marx is, at least, not far left enough. So very, it, it is very obvious that from the normal perspective, uh, the sort of normal perspective or, uh, you know, right perspective. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say normal. Uh, maybe uh, the right perspective of the political spectrum, Biden is far left. If you're talking to people who are on the right, yeah, you should say Biden is far left. He, he has all of these policies that are very, very far left and something we've never seen in American politics before. But if you're talking about it from the left and you're talking about it specifically from the communist perspective, you know, people who would say things like, Vosh isn't that extreme, which by the way, oh my gosh, that was a, that was an insane tweet I saw just today. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't, I wonder why I still uh, subject myself to that platform. Like, geez, that was one of the most insane 
uh, positions I've seen. But, you know, if you're looking at Biden from that perspective, from that extreme a perspective to say, yeah, Vosh is an extreme, <laughs> then of course you're going to say Biden is not left or, or he's center right. Because to you, that's what it looks like. And of course, from the perspective of me, someone, you know, free uh, free markets, completely uh, libertarian, Christian, that sort of thing. Biden's going to look far left. Of course, these these things are actually not in incongruent with each other. They're just looking at it from different perspectives. And both are completely accurate. So, so that was an interesting thing. And an interesting thing I've been seeing for a very long time. But on to our next story, where a New York woman was facing uh, faces 25 years in prison over felony weapon charges after police find cash of fake guns in her home. Now, this is a story ba uh, uh, dating back to December of 2019, where a uh, <laughs> a New York uh, the New York Police Department posted a photo of a successful bus they got of a, uh, of a New York woman's home where they took away 22 firearms. Now, it turns out that 21 of the 22 were not guns, <laughs> were not firearms. They were uh, a race starter pistols, a whole bunch of freaking pellet guns, which by the way, if you, if you knew anything about pellet guns or firearms, you'd notice that pretty instantaneously because some of them, though they were uh, fairly realistic replicas, aren't perfect like one of them uh, one of the ar-15 replicas didn't have a buffer tube <laughs> which for those who know anything about how ar-15s function yeah even if that was a real ar-15 it wouldn't have fired <laughs> or or at the very least it wouldn't have cycled and you wouldn't have been able to get another freaking cartridge into the into the chamber like it just it just wouldn't have worked you know anyone and anyone who knew anything about how ar-15s function yeah <laughs> It, that's just a silly thing. And it, it seriously, 21 pellet guns. This is one of the most ridiculous stories I've ever seen. Now, of course, you'd expect a place like New York, which with one of the most draconian gun laws in the country, uh, to, you know, at least be able to identify, you know, their, their police force, be able to identify what a firearm is <laughs> and what a firearm looks like. And this is like, this is a bust into a private home. And the police force is still claiming that this bust was legit. <laughs> that there were no problems. There was no problems of, you know, oh, this, uh, they got the warrant illegitimately. They're still claiming that. I don't know how, but they are. <laughs> it's just such a stupid, it, it, it's amazing it, because it, to give you the full rundown of the story, the authorities in 2019 raided uh, Zlatik's home and charged her with first-degree criminal possession of a weapon. She faces a possible 25-year prison sentence. Oh, man. And then they posted <laughs> the cops from the, 12th, uh, the 112th precinct arranged it. Arrange the 22 set of weapons seized on the table and post for a Twitter photo commemorating the, the bus. Looking all proud of themselves. Man, we really got those pellet guns off the freaking street. <laughs> they weren't even on the street. They were just in our house. It's insane. Insane. And, you know, you see, it, there are, uh, there's a growing sentiment among conservatives that, hey, all of you guys, all of you police who we have uh, traditionally backed against the inroads of the sort of illegitimate attacks from people like Black Lives Matter and the like. Hey, don't do this crap. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not a supporter of the New York police explicitly. I'm more a supporter of my own, uh, you know, county police and, and the city police, you know, and my local police. And I think it's important to distinguish between support for local police and support for all police naturally, because I do support my local police, and I do support a lot of the police nationally, but I do not support pol all police nationally because it's obvious to to take a, uh, a a phrase from Tim Pool. It's obvious that a lot of these people are oath breakers. This this police department obviously included. This precinct obviously included. It, it is completely insane that they went after this uh, this woman for having. Uh, 
a bunch of pellet guns, and one firearm that didn't have a trigger mechanism or have anything inside of it. It wouldn't have fired at all. Uh, though tech, uh, I think technically it's still a firearm under ATF rules, but of course ATF rules are dumb. <laughs> ATF rules are incredibly stupid, and so I don't know why we should trust them anyway. It's just such a dumb, uh, silly, silly thing. And, and this sort of thing needs to be stopped. Uh, the NFA needs to be repealed. And man, and do I have things to say about the DC Heller case and how that could, uh, that should have been a, a, the case where, D, uh, where the NFA was repealed. But it wasn't because common use standard, uh, common use standard is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard of. It's just such a silly thing. But I'm not going to elaborate on that completely here because, well, I don't have the time for it. Because we have more stories. <laughs> I'll take that for a transition. A judge releases Dominion Audit Report. Cl report claims system, uh, system designed to create systematic fraud. Now, I'm never going to predict anything again. Not with regard to this election, at least. Because, yeah, I was kind of wrong yesterday. I was a bit uh, 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 ahead of the curve, uh, ahead of the... Uh, a bit in front of the gun, you know. So I'm going to take back a little bit of what I said yesterday because all, a lot of this came out just a few hours after I recorded. <laughs> a few hours <laughs> before I actually ended up getting these uploaded uh, yesterday. So, you know, I take it back a little bit. I still don't think it's likely that it gets uh, completely reversed. And obviously, I still, believe, I still believe to a certain extent that, that, that well, I still believe, uh, I don't mean to even qualify that, I still believe that there was a lot of fraud in this election and a lot of shenanigans. I believe a lot of that will eventually come out. I just don't believe it will come out, come out in such a timely uh, uh, in such a timely uh, in a, such a timely fashion as to actually overturn the uh, inauguration and appointment of Joe Biden. But this is a, a good beginning step, and this is this is obviously grounds to sue. I, I think this Michigan. <laughs> lawsuit will potentially go through like and that would be pretty huge because that would mean the electors from the Michigan uh from the state the state of Michigan that were that just voted yesterday are invalid <laughs> which would be a, a very interesting thing to see along with that you have places like Arizona uh, the legislators attempting to put up their own set of electors which will be an interesting thing because you might end up seeing the legislator of Arizona sue the executive of Arizona and in that case the legislator would essentially have to win because the legislator has plenary power over appointing electors and so that would be interesting though I don't really expect it I I, I just don't I don't know I, I don't know I think the Texas case was the last real bastion Hey, I'm open to be proven wrong. To be clear, I don't, it's not like I'm going going around and saying, "Oh yeah, this was, this rejection was totally legit," because it wasn't. But I just don't think it's going to be. You know, a lot of things are going to change over the next few weeks, or at least it's not going to change fast enough for the for you know uh, another president to be inaugurated. I'm kind of dancing around the subject because of YouTube. But anyway, we're going to move on to the next story, and this next story is. Over 150 Minnesota bars and restaurants are set to defy COVID-19 restrictions. And now, this is coming, uh, there are multiple stories to this effect going around. Uh, you have another one of like a small town in, I think it was Washington, uh, they, where they are just completely ignoring all of the COVID restrictions from the state. And you're seeing this more and more where there's a lot and a lot of people who are starting to get completely fed up with the government's lockdowns and are intent, at least, at least at this point, to justify them outright. And this is a good sign because the courts, despite their uh, complete lack of, uh, of courage on the part of the election, have been pretty consistent in defending people's rights in the face of COVID restrictions. Just take the Cuomo, uh, Cuomo Supreme Court case that happened just a month or two ago. That's a, that's a good example of the Supreme Court saying, no, you can't just violate people's First Amendment rights because COVID. And so you might see similar things happen in the response to this story. Because you see, this group is calling themselves the Reopen Minnesota Coalition. 
and they're planning to re reopen this week in defiance of potential COVID-19 restrictions if they are extended. Now, the restrictions that are currently in place in this Minnesota are set to uh, expire this Friday. I think it was, I think it was this Friday. No, last Friday. Sorry, they they were they were uh, set to expire last Friday, and are expected to be a re be renewed on Wednesday just this week, so just tomorrow. And the these restaurants are and bars are saying no, we're not going to uh, co uh, 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 concede to this. We're not going to just be complacent in this. And this is really really a positive development, and th this needs to happen more and more. If you for instance, if you are uh, still limiting yourself, and uh, and I mean like, are you if you're staying in the house more than you normally would, or you're not going around, if you're not walking around, if you're uh, co coalescing to the sort of completely authoritarian COVID dictates, you need to stop, all right? And you know, I'm not saying stop wearing a mask in like pu uh, private businesses for now, because you know, for the time being, uh, just. I don't think it's really worth it to ruffle, uh, rustle everyone's jimmies for the time being. Though, of course, I do. Uh, I will be uh, completely rustling every everyone's jimmies just in a few months here. I, I do expect to do that, and I will do that. Hold me to that, in fact, because I will do that, and I will refuse to wear a mask from that point forward. And I will be acting completely normally, by the way. So, so that includes just limiting my social distancing and all uh, uh, to none and all that sort of thing. And you know, we need to start seeing this. We really do, especially now that the va uh, that a vaccine has already been put out and a second vaccine is on the way. It's it's expected to uh, the Moderna vaccine is expected to be approved this week. You, you know, now that we have two vaccines in the pike. I don't see the reason to to continue to to act like cowards. <laughs> like, I, like there's no legitimate reason now, no legitimate reason. It, it's just such such a ridiculous thing. It, it, truly, people have been uh, lulled into cowardice, and that includes me to a certain extent. I mean, if you had told me back in February to wear a mask and uh, going to a store, I would have told you no. I, I legitimately would have told you no. And it shows that I do, you know, put on a mask when I go into stores that require them, that I am at least a little bit more cowardly than I normally would have been. And I really want to call a uh, claw that back. <laughs> and I think maybe even uh, limiting myself and, and uh, pushing that date back might be a disadvantage, but it, it might be a bit of cowardice on my part. But, you know, it, it's, it's something to be seen. And I, of course, I, I don't expect to be perfect. I'm not. I, if I were perfect by my own moral standards, my moral standards would be too low, as I'm fond of saying. But, you know, I, I do think this is a very important development, and I hope that it develops into even more people doing this sort of thing, especially with the business lockdowns, which are just egregiously terrible. They're just egregiously terrible. Yeah, but that's where I'm going to leave you today. This has been Breaking on the Daily. I'm Kel Kidman, and I'm out.